Um, th this, this next part has become one of my favorite uh, sessions for the ACMG meeting. Um, it's the TED, TED style talks, and as the title implies, the speakers have been vetted, uh, very well vetted, and they've rehearsed their talks, and they, they uh, each have something um, very that they feel very passionate about that they want to convey to you. I would encourage everybody to come down as close to the front as you can. There are many seats here. The message that they're going to convey is much more easily received if the closer you are to the stage because you can see their, the passion in them. Uh, the first speaker is Crystal Sosi. She is assistant professor uh, of life sciences at Arizona State University. And she's also the founder of the, uh, the Biodata Bank at, at Arizona State University. Um, She's going to speak to you a little bit about uh, some of the issues with uh, indigenous indigenous populations. The second speaker is Shari Angerleiter. She is uh, an advocate for carrier screening, and she works with J-Screen out of Emory in Atlanta, and she's going to talk to you, as, it, as it, her title implies, about... Um, about carrier screening. And then the final, the final uh, talk is from Versha Pleasant. She is a clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology from the University of Michigan. Michigan. She's also the director of, breast, of, of uh, cancer research and breast health at the University of Michigan. And she's gonna talk to us about breast cancer in, and in uh, uh, un underserved populations. So I'm not gonna take up any more of the time and I'm really excited for these people to give, their, uh, give us their talks and we're gonna start with Crystal here. Ready to walk up? Yet a avena. She a can the chini, the sleep door, the kite in the air, but the chin. Told the chini that's a door, Dr. Crystal says he this yet. Don't worry, the rest of this talk will not be in Dinefizad, it'll be in English. But I am really um, pleased and honored to talk to you about my own experiences as an indigenous geneticist and ethicist on the brink of deciding whether or not to pursue genetic screening for my own self. So as a financial disclosure, I do want to disclose that I happily accepted some money from Regeneron to speak last year at the Drift Symposium, which is right before the American Society of Human Genetics meeting. And that relationship has now ended. But I do want to start with this very essential framing that in order to ameliorate health disparities in indigenous communities, da, 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 we need more indigenous participation in genetic studies. This is something that I think if you open any peer-reviewed work by geneticists or genomicists, you see this type of framing. This, it's almost a trope that in order to ameliorate health inequities, we just need more indigenous patients and participants, which means usually recruitment. Yet despite efforts to increase diversity in genomic studies over the past decade, we still have less than 1% of indigenous peoples participating in genomic studies. Now, even with the recently expanded panel of medically actionable genes, we still only have information on five of those that's specific to indigenous genetic variation. Only five out of 83, which leads to a very important question. What does this do? to clinical utility. How does this affect patient care and how we are informing indigenous patients about their risk? What does this do in terms of somebody wanting to interpret for themselves their own test results against this backdrop of a lack of information rel relative to themselves? This also relates to another question. Where is that data coming from? So, Often this comes from large-scale diversity projects who have, who have legacies that have been criticized by global indigenous populations worldwide, such that over 600 of them went to the United Nations asking them for the cessation of these large-scale diversity projects. They, 600 nations asking for the halting of genetics works in their communities. So, Absent the uh, recruitment of new participants, we have the buying and selling of indigenous genomes 
almost like trading cards, because there's this huge black market of individuals wanting to utilize already sourced DNA that has been collected before tribal IRBs or RRBs exist. Then there's also just the complete ongoing use and collection of indigenous samples from groups whose own existence is not really recognized by the own colonial governments. And even at our borders, where we have in, in, indigenous children ripped from their parents, we have the collection of, of indigenous people's DNA for other migrant um, 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 collection purposes. But this, I do want to just highlight this key question of who is this information benefiting? And what are we telling indigenous peoples when we want to collect their, their information? So in 2007, a New York Times reporter went to the Karishiana, which is a tribe in the central Amazonian region and a heavily researched indigenous group, and basically asked, what was it that researchers promised you in exchange for your DNA? And they said, we were promised medicines. We were promised therapeutics to cure the conditions that are affecting our people. And, you know, they were shocked. They were dismayed when they learned that their uh, samples were being sold at a rate of $75 to $85 a vial. Now, this story is, has some parallels with another narrative that we talk about in genetics and bioethics, which are HeLa cells collected from Henrietta Lacks. But, from the point of collection to the point of what we're promising in terms of community benefit and medical intervention, how are we actually getting from step A to step C? And I ask this question to scientists a lot. What are you promising and how are you actually actualizing your, uh, those delivery of those promises? And unfortunately, a lot of researchers say, it's not my domain. You know, I published a research it advances the, the, the literature, and eventually one day, somehow, that's going to translate to direct benefit for communities. But meanwhile, those indigenous peoples and communities are dying now, and they cannot wait decades for the next intervention, innovation, invention, utilizing their information. So if indigenous peoples are not benefiting first, from the sharing of their DNA, then who is? I also want to highlight uh, something in terms of the pathway of what we're asking uh, indigenous peoples when we are asking them to sign individual informed consent. That language centers risks and benefits on the level of the individual, which is already culturally inc inconsistent with how indigenous people self-govern. We utilize and have always utilized since time immemorial a, a sense of communitarian or group ethics in which we consult our community, our council, for whether or not we should partake in anything, including genomics research. And then we also have to consider, are we actually mitigating these risks when we, de -class when we classify data as de-identified? De Does the simple removal of information really mitigate that risk of re-identification? And there are several papers in informatics that say no, that you can easily re-identify and generate information with as few as three parameters. So there's this myth of de-identified data that and we, yet we perpetuate laws and policies that are just basically built on this promise that removing information is going to mitigate the risk, and we have to question whether or not that's accurate. We also have to start thinking about in terms of group risk, because when you're collecting information from a small, easily re-identifiable group in which one person can re-identify a huge portion of that person's community, now we open ourselves up to genomic racial profiling. And this is something that we do not disclose when we are just highlighting individual autonomy and agency and decision-making authority in our language and our law and policies. So fundamentally and ethically, the standard for individual informed consent is inadequate for indigenous communities, especially for genomics. So I want to take a step back and really talk to you how this relates to me personally and how it relates to my family members growing up 
That picture on the right is actually my grandmother's house, Shemasana. And she actually lives in a, a modern version of a one-room hogan, which um, in order to heat this, you need uh, blocks of coal or you chop wood. You don't have plumbing. You don't have electricity. It's beautiful, actually. Um, <laughs> just need Wi-Fi, and I think I'm good for life, actually. That picture on the left is actually uh, from the Na uh, Navajo Water Project. It's a, it's a Dinesh gentleman who looks astoundingly like my grandfather. And what he's doing is he's standing next to these water barrels. And we, even though our lands are built on a system of natural aquifers, due to the, the usurpation of those rights of, of water from our communities, we actually don't have access to the water that's very beneath our feet. So we actually, in drought conditions, have to drive sometimes over an hour one way just to get water that we siphon into these barrels. And just to give you a, 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 a little bit of a statistic of what that discrepancy looks like, the average American household uses something like 72 to 75 gallons of water per person today, per day. And indigenous peoples, our people use something like two to four to feed ourselves, our livestock, water, our plants. When COVID hit, you know, the key preventative measure for mitigating that viral transmission is washing your hands. That was something we could not do. So if you can think about the lack of resources, natural resources and rights, also think about what that means for our healthcare system. This is the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. It's the largest Indian Health Service Center for indigenous peoples in, in the US. And my dad actually worked there for 42 years before he retired recently. Now, I'm a first generation college student. My, my parents didn't go to college. I, I'm the first one to actually uh, graduate for, with a degree in, in just at the bachelor's level, nonetheless at the graduate level. My dad actually worked in the power plant that, that helped service this, this community or this hospital center. And uh, I, I remember fondly this experience of, of as a volunteer in the pathology department, basically collecting samples and kind of going shush, 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 shush from, the, from, the, from the clinic to the, the pathology lab a little bit down the way. Uh, but it looked like it was built in the 70s. You had the coloration of like the, the oranges and the lime greens and the browns. Um, and I, 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 I kid you, I'm not... I wasn't born in the 70s. I won't tell you my real age, but just know it wasn't you know, two decades um, uh, beyond that. But I, I tell you this because I think it should highlight a little bit about the discrepancies in terms of how funding is allocated for our communities. Now, the federal government has a right by treaty to deliver health care to indigenous peoples, and yet that care is delivered at a rate of 2.4 times less than the national capita per, uh, expenditure per patient. So we could talk about the importance of collection of genomic information for ameliorating health disparities, but the fundamental fact is that if we are not addressing structural barriers to health, then I think we're over-promising something to community members. And if we repeatedly tell them that your lack of participation in genomics research is going to fundamentally increase these health inequities and these gaps in care. What are we doing except perpetuating that cycle of blame and coercion? So we really have to rethink our messaging. <sighs> so this is, uh, I, I, again, I want to just tell you what it was like for me, pregnant for the first time a couple years ago, uh, questions that I had from my genetic counselor when I was at the cusp of deciding whether or not to engage in prenatal cell-free uh, screening. So right off the bat, I de declined carrier screening just because of that lack of background information uh, related to indigenous peoples. And um, our conversation was pretty short, actually, uh, when it related to like spending time to describe what a microsatellite deletion is and you know what uh, an aneuploidy is. I'm like, no, no, I'm I'm good. But my question was for my genetic counselor was, can I opt out of data sharing? Now this is something that I give due credit to my genetic counselor. 
it was almost like a funnel of, you know, what are the options that were available in that healthcare system? And she did her, did her due diligence and calling all of those vendors and asking, what are the data sharing opt-in and opt-out policies? Which one of those allow participants and patients to opt out of data sharing? And we came down to one. Now, even though I was really fortunate to have that one option, there were other questions that, you know, I, I had to reflect on my own privilege and realize that other Indigenous peoples, there's a huge question of whether or not they can afford that option if it's available. And then we also need to talk about public databases like ClinVar and the deposition requirement of that data. So in my two children, which I actually love, I actually um, uh, sought this question in two different healthcare systems. With my first uh, child, I actually had a genetic counselor that was available to me who did the background work uh, to find these questions out for me. But for my second child in a different healthcare system, there was no genetic counselor available, even in an urban health center like an area like Phoenix. And that consenting was formed, performed by a nurse. And this hospital system did not have an option in which I could opt out of data sharing. And unfortunately, my results were delivered to me by a portal before I actually had a conversation with a health provider. So in terms of contextualizing what this means for an indigenous person in a rural setting, you know, imagine how far we have to go one way for water we also sometimes have to travel three hours somewhat times in one direction just to seek the care of a specialist. Is there a genetic counselor that's provided in that system of care who can contextualize those, those results? Are those results also contextualized against this relative lack of background information specific to indigenous variation? What types of training is available to deliver culture-specific care? Are those patients being fully informed about their options related to data sharing? Remember, that could constitute a failure to do adequate informed consent. What is the potential impact due to a high false positive rate? And this is something that I'm actually kind of reticent to, to share because there's a lot of policies that need to be driven and there's a lot of entities that may uh, misuse this information, but a lot of Indigenous patients who seek their care in IHS, that information is not protected by GINA, which is incredibly scary and shocking. So that's why I'm actually uh, incredibly proud and honored and excited that I uh, actually trained one of the first genetic counselors who, is in, who comes from an indigenous community to service her, her, her peoples. And I'm also really pleased and honored that one of my students just got accepted to the Master's in Genetic Counseling program at Arizona State University. One of the things I am, I am really fortunate to be able to do with my platform and also with the connections that I have rebuilt in Phoenix is to really take the opportunity to do stakeholder engagement across all different entities in that pathway to care and really ask what are the knowledge gaps? What are the, the care gaps? And also how can we move forward training more indigenous genetic counselors? And I want to remind that Indigenous genomic data sovereignty is a thing, that we have to be responsive and also respect the fact that we need to have better consenting processes and engagement processes when working for Indigenous nations because they have a fundamental right, a sovereign right to govern the agency and authority of data that comes from their people. And it doesn't just relate to research, but also relates to public health and also clinical care. And that's something that we need to think about moving forward. And finally, I think it's important to realize that in the rhetoric of advancing ethics, equity, and justice, that the next big discoveries to advance clinical genetic and genomic testing will be likely in small populations like ours. That these people, my people, indigenous peoples, are the same groups that have been historically oppressed in biomedicine. Our future depends on empowering indigenous-led pathways for building trust and care in research and in public health and in our clinical responsibility to working with participants and patients. Yeah, thank you so much.
August 24th, 1994, was one of the best days of my life. It was the day that my first child, Evan, was born. My husband, Jeff, and I were so happy that after nine long months of anticipation, we were blessed with a beautiful and healthy child. We had the joys of watching Evan develop normally for the first six months of his life. He was so eager, responsive, and he was happy and loved being around people. We also had the normal hopes and dreams for his future. Dreams and plans of watching him grow up, go to school, make friends, participate in sports, and do anything and everything that he wanted to do. During the next few months, as we noticed that Evan wasn't developing at the same pace as other children his age, we started to become concerned. We noticed Evan's friends begin to crawl, sit up, walk, talk, and interact with each other. Evan wasn't able to do any of this. He just watched and smiled. But soon his smile began to fade and his observing became a distant stare. He couldn't stand or even sit by himself. He started to become irritable and wanted to be held all the time. He also began having trouble swallowing, which made mealtime stressful for both him and us. We fought the tendency to compare and instead we considered his differences to be within an acceptable range of time for development. At 10 months, we brought Evan to the pediatrician for what we thought was a standard well visit. But this turned out to be the beginning of our nightmare. Our pediatrician was concerned with the lack of Evan's development in almost all areas. She recommended that we see a pediatric neurologist, which we did immediately. The next three months had us going from doctor to doctor and hospital to hospital where Evan underwent numerous, uncomfortable, and often painful testing. Many of the doctors who we saw asked if we was ever tested for Tay-Sachs. I responded that I was and that I'm not a carrier, so my husband didn't need to be tested. Instead of playing, Evan was being sedated for tests, having blood drawn for analysis, and skin and muscle removed for culturing. All the while, we were trying to comprehend what could possibly be wrong with our son as he began to progressively worsen. In the meantime, we took Evan to see a pediatric ophthalmologist. Midway through the exam, the doctor discovered a cherry red spot on his retina. Hearing this news was like having a dagger stabbed through our hearts, as we knew it was an almost certain indicator that Evan had Tay-Sachs disease from all of the research we had done over the past several months. I contacted my OBGYN, who upon re-examining my records discovered that I had actually tested positive as a Tay-Sachs carrier. A series of errors occurred as my results were transferred from one lab to another and then on to my doctor. This created a perfect storm which resulted in me not knowing I was a carrier. So we didn't think there was a need for my husband to be tested. <clears throat> I called Evan's neurologist, who said, I think we found the missing piece to the puzzle that we've been searching for. A few days later, after further testing, Evan was diagnosed with Tay-Sachs disease. Our lives had now changed forever. We researched the likely progression of Tay-Sachs and had to deal with the fact that even with the best of care, Evan would likely not live to reach the age of five. We immediately met with the surgeon and decided to have a feeding tube inserted so that Evan would be able to stay nourished and medicated. We also decided to have a fundoplication done at the same time so that as the disease progressed, it would be less likely that he would aspirate on his food and secretions. Due to Evan's inability to move on his own, he had to undergo several hours a week of physical therapy so that his muscles wouldn't atrophy. He also had to undergo occupational therapy to help manage the decline in his quality of life. Evan became blind and deaf. He developed seizures and would have several dozen a day. He also had very bad respiratory problems, which required us to provide chest physical therapy and to suction him regularly. Due to the certainty of an early death, but the uncertainty of the exact timing, we wanted to make sure that we didn't take a moment of his life for granted. We knew that we wanted to care for him at home so that we could spend as much time with him as possible. 
thanks to the help of some wonderful nursing care that was able to happen. We had to exercise extreme caution with Evan, both inside and outside the home, so that he wouldn't be exposed to any germs that would cause unnecessary illness. A simple cold would turn into pneumonia and require IV antibiotics and a hospital admission. <clears throat> Evan required care 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because he had lengthy tube feedings, round-the-clock medications, and multiple breathing treatments daily. Luckily, we had an amazing support system to help with his care. Evan lived until he was almost four and a half years old. His disease obviously impacted our entire family. He was truly an angel who brought out the best in everyone around him, and he was loved by all. Some of my best memories from when Evan was alive are the times that we would take him to the beach, the park, or the pool. But instead of packing picnic, picnics and toys, we were dragging along the necessary medical equipment that he needed throughout the day. Although we knew that Evan's disease was terminal, my husband and I were completely shocked when he died because there's no way to prepare yourself for the loss of a child. We now have three other children who fill our lives with joy. Justin, who's 26 and in medical school, Lee, who's 23 and getting a degree in occupational therapy, and Sydney, who's 20 and also pursuing a degree in occupational therapy. With each of my other pregnancies, I updated my carrier screening for diseases that were added to the panel. Knowing that Jeff and I were both carriers for Tay-Sachs, we were able to make family planning choices that enabled us to have healthy children. We chose to get pregnant naturally and have a CVS test performed at 11 weeks. While we have three healthy children, I also had two other pregnancies. One that was affected with Tay-Sachs and we decided to terminate, and another that ended in a miscarriage. Well, I know that IVF with genetic testing is a widely used option nowadays, that wasn't the case when we had our children. With all of my pregnancies, I experienced what it was like to have a choice and to not have a choice based on accurate genetic information. And from the bottom of my heart, I believe that every couple should be able to make educated decisions based on accurate genetic information. I feel that a parent's responsibility is to help their children and to protect them from pain and suffering. And this begins from the moment of conception. While we're so blessed to have our other children, it doesn't take away from or replace the tremendous loss that we feel every day. I constantly imagine what it would be like for us as a family if Evan were still alive and healthy. To honor Evan, I decided to turn our family's tragedy into something positive so that others would be spared the suffering that we experienced. I became an advocate for carrier screening. My life's mission for the last 25 years has been to educate and make people aware about the importance of carrier screening and not just for Tay-Sachs. I feel it's essential that providers recommend carrier screen, preconception carrier screening along with genetic counseling to anyone who is planning to start or add to their family. As you all know, the purpose of this is to identify and counsel at-risk couples, preferably before pregnancy. These couples should understand the impact of the disease that they carry on an affected child and the implications it can have on the family it's born into. And they should understand the reproductive options so they can choose the path that's right for them. My advocacy work began shortly after Evan's diagnosis. When I reached out to National TASACs and Allied Diseases Association, or NTSAD, in hopes of finding support. We were connected with families who were experiencing or had experienced what we were living through. The support of these families helped us through the most difficult time of our lives. We were all faced with the daunting reality that our children had been, have been diagnosed with a rare and fatal neurological disease with no hope for treatment or cure. In fact, we were all told that a treatment or cure wouldn't be possible in our children's lifetime and likely not in ours either. A 
A few families banded together in hopes of finding researchers and clinicians who would be able to collaborate and help save our children. In 2002, we created the, an, a research initiative, followed by the creation of the gene of the Tay-Sachs Gene Therapy Consortium in 2007, with the goal of initiating clinical trials. Over the past two decades, genetic science has rapidly evolved. Hard work, dedication, and persistence has led this team to their goal of reaching human clinical trials. It's been so rewarding to be part of this process and to see how far research has come. The reality that a child with Tay-Sachs may one day be able to be treated is truly amazing. I also served on the board of NTSAD for over 20 years in various roles, including past president. <clears throat> Evan's diagnosis and the fact that it was due to a series of errors was always so unsettling to me. I thought I was being responsible by being tested for Tay-Sachs and relying on my physician's interpretation of my results. I was never told that I could speak to a genetic counselor, and I never knew that there were other diseases to be tested for. How I wish I had been given that information. I knew that there was something I had to do about it. In 2005, the Jewish Genetic Disease Consortium, or JGDC, was formed. I immediately began working for them and continue to do so. The JGDC is an alliance of nonprofit disease organizations that that increase awareness about genetic diseases and encourage timely and appropriate carrier screening. Through my work with the JGDC, I educate medical professionals, clergy, and the lay population about the importance of carrier screening throughout the country. I also work with a group called the Access to Equitable Carrier Screening Coalition. This organization ensures that people know that there's expanded carrier screening by building key relationships with stakeholders such as patient groups, and educating payers about carrier screening to ensure coverage. Last year, I started working for JScreen, a national nonprofit health initiative based out of Emory University School of Medicine's Medical Genetics Department. JScreen's goal is to educate people about their genetic risk and to provide testing and counseling. Testing is provided through an at-home saliva kit and results given by one of our genetic counselors via phone or video conference. In my role with JScreen, I'm not only educating about the importance of carrier screening and genetic testing, <clears throat> but also providing a resource that's accessible and affordable to everyone in the United States. This information needs to be more widespread. An informal poll done with commercial labs that offer carrier screening indicate that 90% of people who are offered screening through their physician are already pregnant, and a vast majority are only being offered screening for a few diseases. It's simply not acceptable. There are guidelines such as those with the ACMG that recommend more expanded screening for anyone planning a pregnancy. Carrier screening isn't only indicated for high-risk populations anymore, it's recommended for everybody. In the case of people coming through J-Screen, 93% are getting screened before pregnancy. This is a major accomplishment, because one of the goals of carrier screening is to identify couples as early as possible <clears throat> to provide them with as many family planning options as they can. If a couple only learns of their risk, when they're already pregnant with an affected child, they're offered only two options, to continue the pregnancy or to terminate. And depending on where they live, they may only have one option. To emphasize why carrier screening is so important before pregnancy, I want to share a story with you. I was recently contacted by a woman towards the end of her second trimester when she learned that the baby she was carrying had Tay-Sachs disease. She wasn't offered carrier screening until her first prenatal visit. Four weeks later, her results came back and indicated that she was a Tay-Sachs carrier. At that time, it was recommended her husband be screened. Four weeks passed and his results came back and he too was a carrier. At this point in her pregnancy, it was too late for a CVS, so she had to have an amniocentesis right away. 
During the next six weeks, she and her husband experienced fear and anxiety while waiting for the amnio results to come back. Tragically, those results were devastating, and it was confirmed that the baby had Tay-Sachs disease. To make matters worse, they live in a state where termination is illegal. They were heartbroken to learn that the child they were carrying had a fatal disease and what that child would endure during its lifetime. She needed to speak to someone who understood the pain and despair of having a child with Tay-Sachs disease. So I shared our journey with Evan and what it was like to have, to have him and to see him suffer every single day. Ultimately, they decided to terminate, but in order to do so, they had to leave their home and travel to a state where it was legal. This could have all been avoided if she were only offered screening before she was pregnant. Please join me in my quest to educate providers who care for women of reproductive age about the importance of carrier screening coupled with genetic counseling. If you're a physician or a genetic counselor, take this information back to your hospital. Educate OBGYNs, pediatricians, family medicine doctors, and internists. If you belong to a temple or a church, recommend that your clergy talk about this during premarital counseling sessions and share this with your family and friends. What I ask of you today is when you leave here to make a commitment that you are going to educate people in your lives about the, the importance of carrier screening coupled with genetic counseling. And feel free to reach out to me because I would be happy to come help you educate your community. I'll also be here the rest of the conference in the exhibition hall at booth 1123. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. My name is Dr. Versha Pleasant. I am a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and I serve as director of the Cancer Genetics and Breast Health Clinic at the University of Michigan. I am so excited to speak to you today about my talk titled, A Tale of Two Women, Racial Disparities in Breast Cancer Genetics. My goal today is through the lens of these two women to talk about and to delve into the gaps created by racial health disparities in genomics, to talk a little bit more about the past and the present, how they're similar, how they're different. And then, how do we move forward? How do we create a more inclusive and equitable genomic landscape? I do not have any disclosures. I do have permission to present the information in this presentation. And also, moving forward, I'll be using the word black to describe people of the African diaspora, although I fully understand the challenges when we talk about race and ethnicity in the setting of genetics. Let's talk first about Virginia Todman. Virginia Todman was born in 1897 and died in 1956. She was born on the small British Virgin Island of Tartola, known for its sugarcane plantations, which unfortunately have its roots in the transatlantic slave trade. Virginia Todman, therefore, was the direct descendant of Afro-Caribbean slaves and also had Native American ancestry. We don't know a lot about Virginia Todman, but we know that she was a kind person with a sweet demeanor. She grew up on a farm, she had seven children, and was overall a very healthy individual. She moved to Philadelphia in the 1950s, to help her eldest daughter care for her four young children. She was on the trolley one day in Philadelphia, and a stranger brushed past her breast. She immediately started feeling pain and told her daughter about how significant this pain was becoming. Her daughter examined her breast, only to find that it was completely black. By the time she sought medical care, it was too late. She was diagnosed with advanced stage breast cancer, did not undergo any treatment, and died at the age of 58. Let's talk about another woman, Maxine Jones, the granddaughter of Virginia Todman. 
She was born in 1948 and died in 2017. She was born in the U.S. territory of St. Thomas and moved to Philadelphia in the 1950s. She also was a very healthy individual, had two healthy pregnancies, and was incredibly vigilant about her annual mammograms, especially given her grandmother's history. However, at age 52, she noticed a rapidly growing mass on her right breast. She stated she felt like it came up and appeared overnight. She underwent a breast biopsy that demonstrated invasive breast cancer and had negative hormone receptors. She underwent a right mastectomy to remove the nine centimeter tumor on her breast. I am an OBGYN and we often use 10 centimeters as our guide because that is the size of a fetal head. So you can imagine how large this mass was. She underwent chemotherapy and radiation. Now, Maxine also developed a subsequent breast cancer. The age of diagnosis is unclear, and we don't quite know whether this was a new primary breast cancer or if this was a recurrence of her previous breast cancer. And if that were not enough, she then was diagnosed with uterine cancer at age 66, pathology demonstrating clear cell carcinoma, which we understand as a rare and aggressive form of uterine cancer. Maxine underwent a hysterectomy, a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, only then to experience a recurrence of her uterine cancer with invasion to her bladder. She underwent chemotherapy and attempted to enroll in clinical trials but was denied due to poor performance status. She underwent numerous hospitalizations for urosepsis, multiple pulmonary emboli, eventually was transitioned to hospice, and died at age 69 due to complications from her metastatic uterine cancer. Before she passed, Maxine Jones underwent genetic testing. She had a 17 gene panel performed, and although it did not demonstrate any pathogenic variants, she did have three variants of unknown or uncertain significance in ATM, BRCA1, and MLH1. Now, as we know, for patients with pathogenic variants in these genes, cancers that we become concerned about include, but are not limited to, breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. But again, Maxine had variants of unknown significance. And her report reiterates, this is an inconclusive result. This result does not explain the history of cancer in you or your family. So, we have two black women whose genes are intertwined, whose histories are intertwined, both of them affected by these aggressive cancers. The difference, though, is that Maxine lived during a time where she could undergo genetic testing, but for whom, unfortunately, genetic testing did not offer any answers, any clarity to her diagnosis or to her prognosis. Now, unlike those two women, this woman needs no introduction. This is one of my favorite actresses, directors, humanitarians, who has single-handedly changed the landscape of genetic testing in this country, with some data suggesting that referrals to genetic counselors increased by 285% when she published her op-ed in the New York Times in 2013 titled My Medical Choice in which she openly discussed her BRCA diagnosis and talked about um, the options to undergo risk-reducing mastectomy. I love Angelina Jolie. And this was a snippet from that op-ed from 2013, and she says, for any woman reading this, I hope it helps you to know you have options. I want to encourage every woman, especially if you have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer, to seek out the information and medical experts who can help you through this aspect of your life and to make your own informed choices. So as much as I love this piece, I wanna challenge the words that we see here. I wanna challenge the concept of options and the concept of choices. Are the same options and choices available to everyone? 
Let's take a step back and talk about why this is important. Why should we care about any of this? And really at the root of all of this is breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among women in the United States and the second leading cause of cancer death right after lung cancer. One in eight women will be affected by breast cancer in their lifetime. That is a crazy statistic. Think about friends that you have, colleagues, family members. You yourself may have been impacted by breast cancer. Every two minutes, there is a new breast cancer diagnosis in this country. So by the time I finish this talk, 10 new women will have received their breast cancer diagnoses. Okay. So this is a, um, a pictorial representation of the incidence of breast cancer in the United States by the American Cancer Society. The two top lines, um, white being the top line and black being the second line, are showing the incidence of breast cancer in the United States. And as we can see, generally similar overall. But the real disparity is here. The real disparity is in mortality. Now, most breast cancers are caught at stage one, and prognosis is about 90% over a period of five years. However, this is different for black women. Black women have a 41% higher mortality related to breast cancer. They represent the top line here. That is astounding. I was recently interviewed by USA Today regarding the state of breast cancer among black women, and I went as far as to call it a national emergency because it truly is. Black women are dying. And why do we think we have this increased mortality in this community? Well, several reasons. It's multifactorial. Um, diagnoses among black women tend to include more aggressive subtypes, such as triple negative breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer. They're more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer at earlier ages. Regarding care and treatment, black women are 1.7573 times more likely to undergo delays in their treatment. We're talking about greater than 60 days from the time of diagnosis to when they initiate treatment. They're less likely to undergo chemotherapy, and they're less likely to undergo surgery. So, genetic testing offers incredible promise as a preventive tool. Imagine, genetic testing could offer early detection and prevention for this high-risk population. How empowering and impactful could it be, could genetic testing be, if performed, like with Angelina Jolie, before a potential cancer diagnosis? Now, once we actually do the testing, there are challenges in classification and interpretation. So the data overwhelmingly suggest that black women are more likely to have what we call variants of unknown or uncertain significance, or VUS. There's an incredible amount of data on this, but I just thought I would include some of the more recent literature. One particular study by Lovejoy et al. showed that in a multi-center cohort, of 488 African-American women, a third of them had variants that could not be classified. Another study by Curian et al. showing that the rates of VUS between 2013 and 2017 almost doubled, particularly among black women and women of Asian ancestry. Another study by Curian et al. showing multiple gene sequencing that increased the detection of VUS with 43% in African-American and 23% among white communities. And finally, this study, looking at the racial and ethnic variation in multi-gene panel testing, showed that while African-Americans were less likely to have a pathogenic variant, they were more likely to have a variant of uncertain significance. This is a great pictorial representation by Popejoy and Fullerton showing the, um, the root of this bias. So these results are all extrapolated from genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. In 2016, we have 81% of GWAS that consist of people of European ancestry. And that's only a modest decrease from 2009, showing 96% consisting of people of European ancestry. And here's a further breakdown of those people of non-European ancestry. And you can see that in the dark blue-purple color, these are the people of African ancestry. 
So still a very, very small percentage. A more recent study, a summary of GWAS studies in 2019, showed that about 52% of studies um, in GWAS consisted of people of European backgrounds, whereas when we looked at the actual individuals, 78% consisted of people of European extraction. These disparities have a trickle-down effect. For a person who has undergone testing, VUS represents testing that offers no actionable results. For if a person has a VUS, intensive surveillance, chemo prevention, risk-reducing surgeries, even cascade testing of family members, none of these are options. Now, there are some data suggesting that most VUS reclassify to benign, but I would say that we cannot necessarily extrapolate that same information to patients of ethnic and racial minority backgrounds because they've been largely excluded from these genome-wide association studies. Now, we've talked about the glaring omissions of blacks from genomic research, but in contrast, America has a very tortured history of the harmful inclusion of black bodies and scientific research. This is an image that probably many of you are familiar with. It's a picture of J. Marion Sims, who is called the father of modern gynecology, with three black slaves, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka, for whom he performed numerous surgeries, vaginal surgeries, unanesthetized, to perfect the repair of the vesicovaginal fistula, a complication from prolonged labor. These surgeries were often, um, were always performed without anesthesia, were often performed in front of an audience with these black slaves being naked on the table. Um, many of them underwent repeated infections until he finally perfected the repair of the fistula using silver suture and then proceeded to perform the surgery on white women with anesthesia. These are also pictures that we're familiar with from the Tuskegee syphilis study, one of the longest studies ever performed in the United States, a study that took place over a period of 40 years looking at the, untreated, the effects of untreated syphilis on black men, for which they underwent repeated numerous harmful interventions, everything from blood draws to spinal taps. They were denied medical care, and their names were even put on lists and submitted to pharmacies so that they could be denied penicillin if they came seeking treatment. Henrietta Lacks, born in Virginia, but came to Baltimore to seek care for cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins University. Her cells were taken from her without her consent or permission and used in scientific research. Just a show of hands, how many people in the audience have received the polio vaccine? I have two. And HeLa cells were used to develop the polio vaccine. And finally, the Virginia Eugenical Sterilization Act, an act in the United States that spanned over 40 years that included forced sterilizations of people that were deemed unfit to procreate. This consisted of thousands and thousands of women, many of whom were poor, some of whom had intellectual disabilities, and many of whom were black, and many of whom are still alive today. Medical history has trended in one of two ways in regards to black people, the harmful inclusion or their detrimental exclusion from medical research. And I call this concept racial health duplicity. It characterizes the problematic duality of medical care among black people in this country, for which both extremes are harmful and both extremes conflict with the pillars of medical ethics. Racial health disparities in breast cancer genetics is a form of racial health duplicity in which the exclusion of black women in these GWAS then leads to challenges in interpretation of their variants, 
which could then have long-term implications on the outcomes of these women, on prevention efforts, on early screening efforts. Instead of precision medicine, there is only medical inertia. But there is hope. There are a number of studies, both in this country and around the world, seeking to include more diverse populations in genomic research. The Thousand Genomes Project is one of them. Newsweek, several years ago, featured a Black Genes Matter issue in which Dr. Charles Rutimi spoke up about the lack of inclusion of uh, minority populations in genomic studies. I call him the Beyonce of racial health genomics. I think he's pretty cool. And he's done a lot with his leadership at the NIH. There's the H3 Africa Project. There's the All of Us Project that are really seeking to include diverse populations and studying their genomes. And finally, there's a large National Cancer Institute grant that's specifically focused on looking at black women and breast cancer, looking at their specific variants and really focusing in and studying the variations that we see in these communities. Um, and then finally, there's also my own research in which I'm looking at the length of time to reclassification for people with VUS who are from racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds. But we still have more to do, and there are opportunities for change. It's really easy to say that we just need to include more diverse communities in our research, but how does that actually pan out? I personally feel that in these funding mechanisms, funders need to be very, very explicit about the inclusion of diverse communities in genomic studies. It needs to be clear, and it needs to be requested. We also need to reach out to black communities. So we talked a little bit about the history of medical mistreatment, which has then fostered a culture of medical mistrust. So we have to reach out to these communities. We have to listen to them. We have to hear their concerns and their worries. And we have to create a culture of trust. It's really, really important to do this to increase the uh, involvement of the black community in medical research and to increase uptake of genetic testing, which is historically low in these communities, to enhance our prediction accuracy of these variants and to potentially identify private variants. And finally, we have to train healthcare providers. There was a study done in Michigan some years ago looking at early onset breast cancer survivors who were black. Many of them had not undergone genetic testing when it was clinically indicated, and many cited the reason for that is because their healthcare provider did not offer it to them. So, is that an issue of bias, or is that an issue of lack of understanding or information on the part of the provider? Unclear, but both need to be addressed. The title of this talk is A Tale of Two Women, but I hope we are able to appreciate that this talk really was not about these two women, but it's about all women whose health may have been impacted by racial health disparities. Maxine Jones was a teacher. She was a principal. She was an incredibly bright woman who loved to question and read and ask. She wrote this question on a piece of discharge paperwork from the hospital. She said, what do you think the root of all of this is, from the breast cancer or from the uterine cancer, are the two connected? I hope that I can, that we can, find an answer to this very important and compelling question. I'd like to thank the following people for helping me to envision this concept of racial health duplicity and for giving me a platform to speak about it. I'd like to thank the ACMG for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to thank my aunt, Maxine Jones, and my great-grandmother, Virginia Todman, whose experience with cancer inspired me to pursue this line of work. Maxine, Aunt Maxine, for her resilience, her grit, her grace during her four-time journey with cancer. I hope that I can continue to honor you and others like you through this very, very important work. Thank you so much for your time and attention today.